how does it, how do you keep that fire within you to, to go on? What's your journey like to get to where you're at now? My journey, although I said those things, my journey didn't truly start until I raised my son. I needed to walk. I needed to be able to communicate because my son was two. Welcome to It's Settled, the Amitros podcast. Each episode, we're going to dig into the humanity in workers' compensation and insurance claims, exploring the stories of injured people and those who support them, as well as the good work professionals are doing in the industry. And now, I invite you to join me, Sean Dean, General Counsel at Amitros and the host of It's Settled. Now, It's Settled. Let's get on to the episode. doing a podcast with Candace Caesar and couldn't be happier to to have her here today. She's just completed her 92nd half marathon. Um, I went and ran six miles this morning, which pales in, in, in comparison to what you do, Candace, but welcome to the podcast. We're so happy to have you here. Thank you for being here, Candace. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it's it very fun. much. I came... Um, to know you through Elizabeth Trask. And I had opened up LinkedIn one evening several months ago and saw this post about this person who's ran 92 half marathons, like 14 triathlons, 21 marathons. I didn't even know what a duathon was. You're going for 50 half marathons in 50 states. And I'm like, this person is my new hero. Who is this and when can we get her on the podcast? And today is the day. So I'm so excited to have you here. And if you've tuned into the podcast before, you know our, our mission with It Settled is to talk to people who've been injured and who have worked through their injuries and gone on to do great things. And you 100% epitomize that to no end. Um, and I, I, I was just inspired by reading your LinkedIn bio. I, I, I can't wait to see what happens after I talk to you for a while here. But I guess where we get started, um, let's get through the hard stuff first and, and you know, tell us a little bit about, I, I, I'm aware um, through reading a little bit about you that you were um, injured while in, in the line of duty um, service to your country in the army. So why don't you tell us about that? Like, tell us about how you got, you decided to enlist in the army and what was your motivation behind that? And then, you know, leading up to, to the accident that I don't want to say it's defined you, but it certainly motivated you to do some inspirational things for sure. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Joining the army. I joined the army May 20th, 1994, for selfish reasons. Mm. I have always been a giver, and I believe that God put me on this earth to serve as a service to others. And what better way to be of service is to serve my country. I did not want to enlist in the Army. I had actually planned to be a commissioned officer. I was going to ROTC. And they gave my airborne slot away to a reservist. And I got very angry. And I went down to the recruiting office and I insisted on enlisting, dropping out of college to secure my airborne slot. And I mm -hmm. said, I'm going to enlist. I'm going to get this airborne slot. And I'll go be a drill sergeant like my father. And then I'll get commissioned as an officer, but I'll be a physical therapist. And that's it. Okay. And as you know, I got injured on active duty. So my dream to be a commissioned officer never happened. I never got to be a drill sergeant because I broke my neck while I was enlisted. Right. So t t talk to us about, if it's okay, about what, what happened. Um, you know, what was your role in the Army? What, what were you doing at the time? And, and what, what led up and, you know, kind of describe the... The, the actual accident itself? In the Army, I was a personal administrative 
specialist. So that's another way of saying that I was human resources, basically. Uh My wartime duty was to toe tag and requisition shoulders. It's not a glorified job, but as an admin specialist, they always said that the best supported the rest. And I was going to be the best personal administrative specialist there could. I was a non-commissioned officer. I had eight soldiers underneath me and we, I can't tell you where we were going. Yeah. I don't remember. But the way I was told was we were moving from one post to the other. We skid on black ice. And as we started skidding towards the guardrail, the axle broke. The vehicle flipped over 10 to 12 times. The non-commissioned officer that was behind me, I was in the front passenger seat. He was flying around in the vehicle, hit me in the back of my neck, my lower back, and somehow I broke C6 and C7 with injury to L5 and S1 of my spinal column and my vertebrae. I received a punctured lung from a broken rib and a traumatic brain injury. Oh my gosh. They got out of the vehicle. I was still inside the vehicle. They heard some weird sounds, what they called weird, and they thought the vehicle was going to blow. So they pulled me out through the front windshield and laid me on the cold ground. Onlookers in Germany gave security blankets and they covered me over, but not under, as we've been instructed in sergeant time training. And I got hypothermia, which is a truly blessing, true blessing, because it reduced the spoiling of my brain. And then I was carried to the local hospital. Oh my God. And what was the, do you remember the date of the injury? Yes, I do. I remember it like it was yesterday. It was December 5th, 1999. Oh my gosh. So you're taken to the hospital. What, what's, what's kind of the first fuzzy memories that come into focus for you? I have several things that came to mind. So initially, I don't know how long I was unconscious, but I do remember coming to. The first person I saw was someone crying over me that looked like Eveline from The Wiz. (laughs) Apparently, my neighbor (laughs) showed up and she was crying, but I didn't know why she was crying. I didn't understand what was going on. And I had tubes in my mouth, tubes in my nose and my throat. I was unable to move anything. Apparently they strapped me down and I closed my eyes. And when I opened them again, I saw another place and it was one of my Eastern star sisters. And she said, Candace, you've been in an accident and your mom is on her way from the States. Don't try to move. And I remember tears going down, warm tears going down my face and I could hear monitors and then my eyes closed again. And when I they opened again, it was fuzzy. I saw a lady in the corner of a room and not realizing that was my mom because I didn't know who she was. I didn't recognize her. Yeah. I heard Deutsch all around me because I'm in Germany. And I thought that I was in a concentration camp. And I would For some reason, I thought Hitler had gotten me and I was in a concentration camp. I was freaking out. So they had to sedate me again. And I would just awaken and fall back asleep. And then finally, they told me that lady in the corner is your mom. And I felt a little safe. And that's all I remember initially. Wow. And and what was the first, when when you kind of really regained consciousness? Um, what, what were you told by the, the attending physicians about your, um, your, your, the extent of your injuries and your prognosis? Like when, when, you know, and what was that like for that to, to hit you that news? First of all, I was very surprised because my doctor was a child prodigy. He was um, a German Doogie Hauser. So he was in his very early 20s, like 21, 22. And he had 
physicians, older people, people older than I was, I was 27 when it happened. And they were walking around and he said, ma'am, you're never going to walk again. He was like, you have, you're a quadriplegic. You're paralyzed on the right side. You may or may not be able to talk like you used to talk. And we're not sure, but I can tell you that you will never walk again. And at that moment, I looked at him and I was thinking, I have a two-year-old son at home. I have to walk. There's no, cannot walk. And without hesitation, I said, you don't know who my father is. And I was talking about God. And I said, I'm going to walk again. And he looked at me like, yeah, right. And I said, as a response to his look, I'm going to walk a marathon, not knowing how long or how far a marathon was. And I, it was nothing to it. It's like, I truly believe that I was going to walk a marathon. I was going to walk again. You can't tell me what I can't do. And I had a lot of adventures in that German hospital. They transported me to the Army, well, actually, it's on it's to launch the facility and conductors at that time told me the exact same thing. And I didn't believe them either. And I said, yeah, right. I have a marathon to walk. Um, so you obviously had gone through boot camp through the Army. Had, had you had any previous running experience? Did you, did you run like a half marathon before you made that statement? Okay, let me tell you. When you go to airborne school, you have to run. I hate running. I don't understand how I even made it through boot camp because I hate running. So whatever the minimum standard was to pass the Army fitness test, that's what I did. Anything over that, no. As a matter of fact, we would do battalion runs. And I'm almost ashamed to tell you that as a non-commissioned officer, I was just shameful. We would go on a battalion run, which was six miles. I would have an asthma attack and fall out. Uh, uh, uh. Anything over three miles, I wasn't doing it. I mean, the APFT is two miles. So if I went maybe two and a quarter miles, oh, I was falling out. Like I just, I could not know how far I had to run. I hate running. So what was, Candace? what was the first kind of big event for you as far as rehabilitation? Was it, was it physical therapy that you went through? I imagine that was probably a pretty grueling process for you but how did you go from I mean your you, the extent of your injuries I mean you're like uh, you describe it as like a walking quad right and what, what what did you immediately after did you go into a wheelchair like what 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 happened could you even walk for me everybody thinks that the walking was really hard if the walking wasn't as hard as you would think the communicating, the, because they went into my throat and I had a trach and they put in a bracket with six screws in my neck. I had to learn how to swallow again. I had to learn to talk. I had a paralyzed vocal cord. That was hard for me because I have always been a talker. I figured I could live life whether I was in a wheelchair or not, but learning to talk, having a wonderful speech therapist, that was hard for me. They told me I had to have vocal rest. I was like, what is that? I mean, I can't talk. Mm -hmm. I had a voice amplifier. That was extremely hard for me. From that, I was like, well, I had to have emergency surgery. As a matter of fact, I had to have an emergency surgery because I had an infection in my throat transforming from the German hospital to the American hospital. So the first day I thought I was going to have physical therapy, I had emergency surgery. So that was disheartening. I remember being put to sleep and asking permission from my mom to cry because I was Mm -hmm. so disheartened, really wanted to do physical therapy. I had emergency surgery. I was in a coma for about another week. And then finally, they're like, okay, you get to go to physical therapy. Well, what do you do in physical therapy when the right side of your body doesn't move? And your left side does move. That was really hard for me because I was like, oh, I can walk. I had dreams that I could walk. So I stood up 
with not a problem and then fell down and took the IV machine, the catheter bags, all that stuff. I stripped it all off the bed and I hit the floor and they were like, what are you doing? I was like, oh, I feel really good. I thought I could to walk, but I couldn't. And over the next six, seven months, I had to get up every day from the wheelchair and try to take a couple steps. And initially, I could only take 10. And that hurt. Like, that was an excruciating pain, just taking 10 steps. And over the course of the year, I was able to walk with a flat foot, a flat bed crutch and a cane. And the reason I had to use a flatbed crutch was because my right side, my right arm, I couldn't open my hand and I couldn't support myself with my wrist. I had to use like my shoulder and a forearm crutch and the left hand was fine. And once I got home, I found out that I had brown Sicard syndrome. And brown Sicard syndrome means that you have sensory deficits on one side of your body and motor difficulties on the other. And so I don't feel hard or cold on the left side of my body. Mm. So you go from, I mean, an active being in the army to, to this horrible accident, to sort of making this proclamation to this doctor kind of, just as you're coming out of things, I, I'm going to, not only am I going to walk, I'm going to walk 26.2 miles. You didn't even know the distance at the time. How do you go from barely being able to walk with a crutch to keeping that commitment to the doctor and yourself to start your journey is a marathon runner, half marathon runner, triathlete, all this stuff. How, how does it, how do you keep that fire within you? To, to go on? What's your journey like to get to where you're at now? My journey, although I said those things, my journey didn't truly start until I raised my son. I needed to walk. I needed to be able to communicate because my son was two. When I got home from the hospital, I had a very interesting relationship with my husband. So my Husband and I didn't get along and he found another woman, a woman that wasn't disabled mm. and we ended up getting a divorce. So that left me as a single parent. So I had to do everything in doing everything. I just found this new fire. It was like, I have to do this for my kid. I have to do this for my kid. And one day my son says to me, He's a senior in high school. He's had his license for about two years. And he says, I'm going off to college. What are you going to do? And I, I had to think about it. I was like, what am I going to do? My entire existence was mm -hmm. being a mom. I'm the soccer mom, the baseball mom, the football mom, the scout mom. I'm a den leader, boy scout leader. I have no identity. I was severely depressed. And over the years, I mean, I was depressed. I would have bouts of depression where I would go and lay down in my room and pull the covers over my head and just lay there and sob. I would get up in the morning like there was nothing wrong. I'd take my kid to school and then I'd go back home and I would do that. But at this moment, I'm thinking, what am I going to do with my life? My kid just said, he's leaving. And I got to going through my bucket list. And I was like, oh yeah, I got this marathon I need to train for. What better time to start training for this marathon? And that's when I found out it was 26.2 miles. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my gosh, well, if I got to do 26.2 miles, I got to figure out a train. Well, Fort Ben Fit was the training group who hosts the marathon that I decided I was going to run on February 15th. No, February 1st, 2015. So it took me from 1999 to 20, 2015 to complete my first marathon. Okay. Do you, I wish you could find that doctor if you knew who they were and go back to them and go, I did it. I really want to, but he's in Germany. I, I've often thought about it. 
you kept your word. Um, that's unbelievable. So tell us about, so you did it. You, you, you did your first marathon. What was that experience like and what did it mean to you to complete it? Cause that must've been the catalyst that got all this stuff going. I mean, now you've ran, you know, you're going for 50 half marathons in 50 States. You're on number 92 for half marathons. That first marathon, there must've been something about it that made you keep wanting to go. It must've been meaningful for you, right? It was very meaningful, me. meaningful to me. Not only do the endorphins, when you're running, when you're moving, when you're sweating like that, there is a release of endorphins in your body and it is nothing like it. Like you feel like you're on top of the world. And my physical therapist once told me motion is lotion. And I believe it. Mm. The more you move, the easier it is. When I first started training for my first marathon, I will never forget. I started without using a leg brace because they were not made for running. And I remember going back and forth to the VA hospital and I was saying, hey, I need a brace for running. And they said, these are AFOs. They are not to be run in. And I'm like, well, I don't understand. You can give a person with no legs a running blade, but you can't help me run. And they're like, you don't need to run. You can do other things. And I'm like, other things like what? When I was in the military, basically they taught me to do sit-ups, push-ups, and run. That's mm-hmm. all I know now. After seven and a half years and now years later, that's all I remember. And that's what I think I need to do. And they were not helpful at all. So I go out, I run with Fort Ben Fit. I'm running my six miles and I fall three times. I trip over my toe because I have foot drop mm-hmm. on the right side. So although I'm a walking quad, I present like a hemiplegic, much like a person who's had a stroke. So that right side does not cooperate. But the left side is overbearing and it does everything. And I remember tucking and rolling three times and I was bloody. And the coach was like, did you drink enough? Are you hydrated? Like, what's up? And I said, I have foot drop. He was like, why don't you run with the orthotic? And I was like, I don't know anything about that. So I went to a podiatrist. And he said, I can't help you. I can make you AFOs, but nothing to run in. So I got on Google and I found a company called TurboMed in Canada. And I ordered a brace that fits on the outside of my shoe, put it on. And the next week the run took about maybe a month to get to me. But I remember when it came in the mail, came in on a Monday and I had a practice run on Wednesday and we on a Friday and we had a long run on Saturday. And I remember placing up my shoe, feeling like I was winning a sprint. Like I had won a spot in the Olympics. Like I felt so free. My toe was clearing the ground. I wasn't tripping. And I went on my first 10 mile run without falling. It was liberating. So after that, I was like, oh yeah, I can take on the world. So I would I ran up to 22 miles before the actual marathon. The day of the marathon came and my coworkers surprised me. They were out there in the dark. I started as a early start. This marathon has a time limit of eight hours. So as long as you run in eight hours, you're good. And I didn't know how long it was going to take. Yeah. And then I would meet people along the course and people were cheering me on. It was a two loop course. So I saw the same people. And I noticed I was passing people up. I'm like, I'm disabled. I'm passing people up. Must be something wrong with them because they're able-bodied. I'm crippled. And so I'm like, are you okay? And I run back and I'm like, oh, you need a peppermint. And I give them a peppermint. Oh, you need a banana. Let me run up to the front. So I run like a mile, will grab a banana and I run back to them. And they meet me like at half a mile and I give them a banana or whatever. And I was like, if I can do it, you can do it. And The people seemed so motivated to keep pushing because I had this energy. Well, I had the energy because I was doing what I do best. I was giving and I've always been a giver. So it's like, oh, I need to give something to these people. And when I crossed the finish line, six hours, 48 minutes and 31 seconds later, not only had I qualified at the time for the Boston Marathon, I knew nothing about that. Being a back of the packer, because I did training ones, I know that. If you come in after the bulk of the runners, there's no food, there's no beverage. Unbeknownst to me, this marathon, they keep ordering food. 
as the time goes on. Well, I was stealing the food, <laughs> hiding it in my car for the slow run. So when I'd see some of the people crossing the finish line, I'd run to my car, grab a pizza and meet them with food. <laughs> and I just began to love the race environment. It was just that race did it for me. So the next week I signed up to do a half marathon. Seven days later, after my first marathon, I had a stress fracture in my foot drop foot because my foot smacks the ground. And I knew I was in pain, but I'm always hurting. I never stop hurting. I have really severe neuropathical pain on the right side. So I did it and I actually ran a PR I ran a half marathon in under three hours. Wow. Excited. And I just kept running from there. I remember I went on a girl's trip to Louisiana to the Zydeco half marathon. And this lady said, hey, are you from Houston? And I'm looking at her really strange. I'm going, there's nothing on me, nothing on my bib. <laughs> my shirt that says I'm from Houston. How do you recognize me? Well, I got to thinking I have locks in my hair and I have leg brace. So you can definitely spot me out of a crowd. And she asked me what happened to me. And what I really wanted to tell her was don't ask me questions while I'm running. I can't breathe when I run. Yeah. I'm out of breath. It's a struggle. I have to like really think to pick my foot up and put it down. But I didn't say those things. I just told her what happened. Told her I broke my neck. It's paralyzed. And. She said, you know, that's inspirational. You should share your story. And as I ran that day, I kind of talked to God and I was like, you know, is this what you have for me? Because I hate running, <laughs> but yet people seem to be inspired by me running. Is this what you want me to do? And I felt like that's what he wanted me to do. He didn't come out and say, yes, Candace, you must run for me. No, I didn't. It wasn't like that. It's just, I got a feeling something came over me and I was like, yeah, I think I'm going to share my story with one person in every state. And I began my 50 states journey. And in October, in the state of Maine, I completed all 50 states. That's amazing. So you're, I love it. I mean, this is, before I met you, I figured like, oh, okay, she's, she's doing this for herself. Like she's, you know, this is, and she deserves every minute of it because she went through so much struggle but you're really doing it for other people. You're not doing it for yourself, which is such a beautiful thing. And it's, it's so emblematic of, of who you are uh, in the short time that I've known you. It's incredible that you've, you've turned in, you've turned something that was, you know, uh, could have been just life ending. And, and you have a quote on, on um, your LinkedIn page that I read that says, the bravest thing I've ever done was continuing my life when I wanted to die. And that's heavy. I mean, that's a heavy quote, but it's so honest and candid. And uh, I, I know that a lot of people can probably, who've been through um, trying times like you can relate to. And it's, it's, it's amazing to, to, to read that and, and see what you're doing. Cause, cause I get it now. And, and when I was, I was looking on your LinkedIn, I'm like, gosh, she's going all 50 States. You know, what, a, what a cool journey for, for yourself, but you're really doing it for other people. So thank you for doing that. Cause you certainly inspired me. Um, and, and when I run Boston in April of 22, I will, I'll definitely be thinking about you. Um, especially going up heartbreak Hill. Um, uh, because if, if you can do all you're doing, I can, I can certainly get through 26.2. Um, and I know uh, you've certainly inspired other people um, just just by sharing your story and certainly being out there on those courses over 50 states. I haven't even been to 50, all 50 states, let alone run half marathons in 50 states. So it's unbelievable. Um, something else I picked up on that I, I didn't last time we talked is by way of profession, you are a speech language pathologist. And I didn't. I always think, you know, oh, okay, she, she went through that horrific accident. It was all muscle skeletal, uh, neurological. I, I didn't think of the speech part when you told me you went through all those surgeries. So is that what motivated you to get into speech and language pathology? That is exactly what motivated me to go into speech and language pathology. I 
never thought about what it was like to not be able to talk until it was stripped away from me. So initially when I was unable to talk, I fell back on some things that I learned as a small child, which was ASL. Being unable to use both hands, I could only sign and fingerspell with one. And that was how I communicated with my mother. One of the ladies at lunch stool was fluent in ASL so she could figure out what my signs were. And she said, it's okay if both your hands don't work. It's a dialect because everybody's hands don't move the same. If you have arthritis, you just have a dialect when speaking. And it made me feel really good. But I was like, everybody in the world does not use ASL. If I can't use my voice, how am I going to communicate with others? And in thinking about that and re- getting my voice back, I was like, what about those who can't? And then I got to reading once I could read again, because I had to read again. I found that there was a shortage of speech language pathologists. And I was like, here it is again. I can mm-hmm. give. I can be a speech therapist. And that's why I chose it. I want to talk a little bit about <clears throat> um, maybe some sources of motivation that you've had. You know, we at Amitros serve um, injured individuals, folks who've been in, in work-related injuries, uh, some minor, some incredibly severe, and and we try to tell their stories. Um, and and what always comes out of those stories is usually a message of hope, but also everybody's different and everybody derives their own motivation and inspiration and their why to keep going. <clears throat> you know, personally, what were some of your, I mean, obviously you had your son that was huge. Initially it sounded like you had your faith. It sounded like you had from out of nowhere, this incredible goal that you're going to start doing marathons it took you a while to get there, but you never lost hope of that. But what else kept you going? Did you have a support system around you? You talked a little bit about your mom. It sounds like she was pretty integral in that part, but what specifically supported you and kept you going? My community. My mom is, is the pillar of support, but my mother does not like anything that hurts me. Mm-hmm. So she would see me after I completed a race. And she was like, why do you doing this to yourself? You shouldn't hurt yourself even more. And I was like, you'll never get it. Like I tried to explain to her and she would be happy as I would finish, but she was not really enthusiastic. But my friends, friends like Elizabeth Trask, people Mm -hmm. that I've met in these different states, they were like, hey, you're going to go to Baltimore the run? I'm going to be there. I'll see you there. And it became like a meetup thing. It was like, oh, I get to visit my friends. Not only do I get to do something for me, I get to do something for others. I get some social time. I spent a lot of years just catering to my kid. I didn't have a life. I didn't have an identity. And now I'm Candace the marathoner. When it got too hard to do the marathons, I've done 24 marathons. Yeah. I did 20 of them running, four of them on a handle because my body just would not allow me to do that. So I had to drop back to doing half marathons. And for a year, I quit doing, I started doing triathlons. I started doing sprints because it was just a FK of running. You know, you swim 750 meters and you ride maybe 10 or 12 miles. And then I decided to do the Olympic distance because I was doing the Chicago triathlon and you got to ride under the Batman cave. So you had to do a a longer run with that and a longer swim. Well, I got to a place where I could swim 1.2 miles and I was like, you know, I think I'm gonna do a half Ironman. But I was like, well, I I can't do everything. Why don't we finish this 50 stage journey first? We can pick that up later. Well, when I finished my 50th state, in Maine, I was at half number 89. And I was like, well, just a few more, I can hit a hundred. So I decided, why not? I'll do a hundred. And then maybe if I feel like doing triathloning, I will, but I just want to motivate people to understand that they can do it too. 
Nobody is going to come and save you. I mean, the years that I spent wanting to die, begging, I was like, you know, I'm not going to do it myself. But if it just so happens, you know, God just so mote it be. I'm okay with that. And he was like, no, that's not, that's not what I for you. I like, I don't know what it is, but I'll hang out here and I'll do what I need to do until then. And it's just that you got to keep living, got to keep pushing because nobody is going to pick you up out of the and make you put on clothes inside. You have to find that intrinsic motivation yourself. You have to parent yourself. Mm. Just like you parent your kids, you're like, get up, go. You say those things to you. And that is what was my driving force. I, I, my own parent. You found that you were your Helping. own cheerleader. I was. I was my own cheerleader. I can't help others if I cannot help me. Yeah. And because I want to help you, I got to help me. And I mean, you're picking some of the most difficult things to do. And it seems like you keep upping it because uh, then you move to wheelchairs, right? Because that's a whole different game. That's a whole different set of muscles. That's entirely upper body. That's all isolated. Very difficult. I mean, you see wheel, these elite wheelchair folks after the races and their hands are bleeding and blistered. So what, what was the transition like for the wheelchair? And now you're going for archery. Like you're doing all this crazy stuff. It's unbelievable. So what, what's next? What's next for Candace? Right now, it's archery. I, the push rimming is really hard on your shoulders. Being a day chair user, like I had to go back, didn't say seriously, but in early 2019, I fell on a training run and I spent a year in a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. That was not fun for me. So I did all kinds of wheelchair exercises and I was blessed to have the veteran wheelchair games. They were virtual and you'd have to do these CrossFit exercises in a wheelchair. And I had to go places to have people help me because I couldn't do it alone because I lived alone. And on slam balls, we were climbs, these, and you're competing against other veterans in their wheelchairs for years. And I was in a wheelchair because I was in a wheelchair for a small time. And then I got out and then I'm back in. And I mean, depression eyes. And I was introduced to art with it. That is something that I never even dreamt was possible. I'm like, a person with one arm can shoot a bow with a mouth tab? Like, what? Like, you can be a double leg amputee and you could still shoot a bow? I'm like, this is amazing. And so I dropped the wheelchair racing, chair crossfit. And I fell in love with archery and I did it. And it was really hard going to the national term. Someone pull your arrows for you and scream for you that I was just determined, you know, I got out of this chair. I'm going to go back and walk. I don't know. I might need a little help with balance, but I want to get my own arrows. And April of 2021, started walking again. And then August, September, October, I finished my last four of my my states. And it's been a hard road. But what I like to tell people is you have to believe. I don't know. Everybody has their own belief system and that's okay. Mm -hmm. But you need to believe. And this is my little kind of acronym. You have to be who you're going to be, who you're just destined to be, because that old person is dead. It is a life altering occurrence when you're injured. Who you used to be is gone. You are a new and improved being. So you have to be and leave the rest behind you. And that's mm -hmm. what I believe. Everybody can do that. Doesn't matter what your faith is, what any be and leave the rest behind. I'll tell you what I believe. I believe that you're my hero. I I am so blessed to be able to do this podcast and speak to injured people who've who've overcome unbelievable obstacles and you have achieved true greatness um and it's to the level of i think like a superhero it's just unreal what you've done and um the inspiration is almost overwhelming 
So I, I can't thank you enough for being on the podcast today and inspiring me personally and, and hopefully inspiring others that listen. So I can't wait to have you back on um, after you've run, you know, I don't know. Well, you're probably going to start running in other countries and make the Olympic team for archery. So we'll have you back on when that happens. But I, I, I think the, the sky's the limit for you, Candice. And I thank you so much for being on. It means a lot. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for joining us for this episode of It's Settled, the Amitros podcast. For more information and episodes, you can visit us at our website at amitros.com. That's A-M-E-T-R-O-S dot com. Or head over to iTunes, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. We hope you enjoyed this episode and look forward to sharing more stories of people overcoming their workplace accidents and bodily injury claims and those who are working hard to make a difference for them. So it's settled. We'll see you next time.